So, welcome to the perfect podcast. That's what I was going to call it. The perfect podcast. The podcast of perfection. Can we get more P's in there? The, the pleasing. practically perfect podcast? No, that's two Mary Poppins. Yeah, well, <laughs> foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know I was... That's foreshadowing I didn't know I was making. I have wanted to talk about with Dan, with just somebody, right? This is something that's been itching at my brain mm-hmm. for years. Um, and it started because you know how pe- you'll be watching like a movie review or reading one or talking to your friends and they'll be like, all right, it's not a perfect movie, but yeah. And that phrase, like I have used it a ton. I bet you can go back through writing excuses and find me saying <laughs> it's not a perfect book, but, uh, and the last few years, it just started to itch at me because mm-hmm. partially it's very weaselly, right? Um, yeah. It's weaselly in this way of I am covering my bases so that if anyone criticizes this thing that I love, I can say, well, I did say it wasn't perfect. <laughs> yes. It's, it has that kind of aura of you can't get mad at me for recommending this, even though I'm recommending this. Yeah, as an aside, first tangent of the of the podcast, <laughs> I remember talking about the Wheel of Time back in the days before I was the Wheel of Time person, mm-hmm. and feeling like I had to do that every time I talked nicely about the Wheel of Time, because the internet dislike machine at that point, the new internet and things, was pretty big on disliking the Wheel of Time, because it had been so long between installments and because uh book 10 had been among people's least favorite and so you know the tides turn against popular things yeah so i would have to preface every time saying hey you know robert jordan does you know is a great author but you know this but let me then talk about and i remember that feeling of feeling like i had to protect myself and my opinions by admitting that they were wrong before i started discussing them just kind of winking at the audience and saying, I'm cool like you. Yeah. Even though I like this thing you don't like. Um, well, and with that per- in, in particular, I remember having conversations with you back in college where, you know, there there was basically a hierarchy of, I want to use the word innovation, but that's the wrong word. How unique, how experimental a fantasy right. novel is. Right. Right. And uh, Wheel of Time sits somewhere on that scale, far away from where, say, Perdido Street Station sits on that scale. And both of them are far away from Neil Gaiman. And however you choose to order them, you know, if if you are a fan of of something, you could like like you know China Mieville, you can look at Robert Jordan and say, oh well, he's just doing normal fantasy. He's right. just doing old school fantasy, which I don't think is a fair comparison. Right. But at the same time, it is kind of a fair comparison. The difference is, I don't think we can equate quality to how experimental something is. That's a very good way of putting it. Um, yeah. I talk about this idea. I learned it partially the terminology I use, though I this idea has been part of my kind of understanding of fiction since the beginning. But the terminology I use comes from Terry Rossio uh, on this one. And he Mm -hmm. is uh, one of the screenwriters on Pirates of the Caribbean and Aladdin and a long, illustrious, distinguished career of excellent movies. And he talks about something called The Strange Attractor in one of his essays back from the 90s about uh, how stories are a mix between the familiar and the strange, right? Every Mm -hmm. story is a mix between these two things. And every genre convention indicates kind of the familiar to you. And within a given genre, you will then find things conforming more strictly to those conventions and things that are pushing back against it. Um, And every reader and every story is looking for a different balance between what you've seen before and what you haven't seen. Yeah. And um, that is definitely an art. Picking where you are on that line is uh, is really important to a piece of art. But the thing is, that's really fascinating is those lines in the readers change when the fiction can't. So mm-hmm. for instance, when Wheel of Time, we're way off topic, but when the Wheel of Time <laughs> released, the Wheel of Time was strange. It was over the line into strange. I wouldn't yeah. call it as far as, because I mean, we, it's not like 
we hadn't seen really weird stuff before, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the reason that China Mayoville is called the new weird is because the old weird was really weird. Yeah. Um, but for its time, for its time, when Wheel of Time released, and you know, the Gandalf character, the wise mentor, was a very flawed woman who barely was keeping things together. That read really different to me as someone who'd read, you know, Al-Anon and Gandalf and all of these characters in that role. Um, And that was very revolutionary to me as a writer, and I think to the genre. But the genre changes, and you go back and you look at a book 30 years ago. I mean, I'm convinced this is part of the problem that um, the John Carter movie had trouble Mm -hmm. taking off. That is not a good movie, by the way. Hey, we will fight later. <laughs> okay. It wants it has a good movie in it fighting to get out. It it oh, we can we can argue about this now. I feel like John Carter was <laughs> ruined by them trying too hard to make a gritty action hero protagonist take the place of the John Carter from the books. I will definitely agree that its biggest flaw is that they don't understand who John Carter is or how to present him properly. Yeah. Um hundred percent. The mythology, the world building, and how they brought that to the screen is really good. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm convinced part of the reason that show had that movie had a problem, and even the development was a problem, is that John Carter is now 120 years old or something like that. Yeah. And all the modern science fiction that we have gotten was built upon the quotes yeah. of John oh, Carter. Oh, absolutely. Like um, th- the thing that really hit it home for me when I was thinking about, well, you know, if I were to do John mm-hmm. Carter, because I have read them all, I, you know, have the matching boxed set, love the books. If I were to adapt it, how would I do it? Well, what about this cool stuff? And like, you know, how I, I was thinking to myself, the visuals of the world are so fascinating because it's like a space opera fantasy, but it takes place in a desert world and everyone wears like cool, like leather strappy things and they're on airships. And I realized I had just described the first act of Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Like note for note, George Lucas was doing Edgar Rice Burroughs and on purpose, like he right. said this in interviews. And so stuff I that was- I believe the word Sith uh, is in the John Carter books. It is, It is yeah. one of the factions. Well, yeah. and even Jedi, mm-hmm. I mean, John, the, the kings of Mars are called Jedax. Right, okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so stuff that was revolutionary when Burroughs was writing today and when feels, Lucas read it. Yeah. And then when he read it, mm-hmm. it today, it's very old hack because audiences have already seen everything just piecemeal. And different. it's like when I worked, <laughs> I had a job uh, where everyone in the office, I did not realize at the time had been quoting Pulp Fiction for a solid year. Right. And when I finally saw Pulp Fiction, I realized, oh, I've already heard every line of dialogue in this movie. I just didn't realize what it came from. We got my theater working. Here's a tangent for a tangent. Uh, <laughs> hey, what a great podcast title, Tangents from Tangents. Um, we got my theater working. Um, it is not fully operational, as mm-hmm. uh, might be said, um, but it of is a battle station. mostly operational. And we turned on Lord of the Rings, um, foreshadowing. Uh, we turned on the <laughs> Lord of the Rings, and it was just a random scene. I'm just like, we want to test the audio, skip to the middle. We, I just skipped to a random thing. And we were sitting there watching, and it was meme after meme, right? Yeah. It, it happened to ha- be the one does not simply walk into Morador scene. It was the, the Council of Elrond, and it was, you know... I, I, you know, that one is a meme, but so many of the visuals, like the, the whole, you know, Elrond is tired of this mm-hmm. meme is you've got an Elrond face in there. That, yeah. Um, and someone from the back, one of my family members or someone said, man, they just ripped off all those memes to make this movie, didn't they? And they did it <laughs> tongue in cheek, but yeah. it is hard to watch Lord of the Rings now for just five minutes. I'm sure if I kept watching, I get into it without mm-hmm. being like, oh. That's a meme. That's a meme. That's that a one. meme. Yeah. Every every scene, every shot of the Star Wars prequels has been turned into a meme at some point. And half the dialogue. Which, let's take this around back to our actual topic. Mm. Um, in light of that, 
how how can we define perfection oh, right. for a piece of art? We haven't even explained. Like I, I said, the thing that's been bugging me, um, right? The thing yeah. that's been bugging me is, can art be perfect? Mm -hmm. Does that phrase even mean anything? It's not a perfect movie, but... Well, what is a perfect movie? What makes a perfect movie? Can you define perfection in terms of art? Is that even a relevant conversation? I don't know. Um... And yet, pertinent to that conversation, we each have brought a list of five perfect movies. Yes, we have, um, which we'll um, get into. Yeah, so I don't know. Perhaps as an opening salvo, mm -hmm. I will say that movies can be perfect within the bounds of their own intention and for their intended audience. Okay, that's a good bound to put on it. I would, And again, that feels like I'm just trying to cover my butt again, right? A little bit. But the problem is when you define what makes a movie good, like you, I think you have to set up parameters, right? What makes a good movie? What makes a good movie? Mm -hmm. um, because there are bad movies that I like, right? Yeah. Um, uh, we have both mentioned before, we are fans of bad movies. Um, this is enjoyable to me to watch um, people fail, but try hard. Like I, I can just watch Plan Nine from Outer Space. Plan yeah. Nine from Outer Space is not a good movie. No, like there is no metric by which you can really count it as a good movie. But it is a wonderful movie to watch. Yeah. Well, and and I think there's two ways of looking at this. There are bad movies I enjoy because they are bad. Mm -hmm. There are bad movies I enjoy because of who I watch them with. Right. And there are bad movies that I genuinely think are wonderful. Oh, there's a. I've got a, a nice story on that one. Robin Hood Men in Tights, right? Mm -hmm. I really like uh, Spaceballs and, um, of course, um, Blazing Saddles. Blazing right? Saddles. And, you Producers. know. Yeah, I just, uh, and so Robin Hood Men in Tights comes out, and I went to watch it with my family. I think we rented it, I don't think. And we got about halfway through. We, nobody was laughing. It was, we just were, it, it, it flopped, belly flopped for us completely. It was on a few years later with my college friends. I think it was us, like uh, the, the writing friends or whatever. We were at a con or something, and it was on late at night in a hotel room. And it that was the funniest stuff I had I ever seen do, in my entire I life. I do remember watching this. Uh, I and I remember rolling. having the conversation of, oh, it's not very good, though. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. isn't there a better Mel Brooks movie on? And then we laughed ourselves sick. Yes. Um, and I still, to this day, do not think that that one is even a good Mel Brooks movie, right? <laughs> but in that moment, it was the right movie for us. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite as good as Ninja The Awakening or whatever it was that we watched. Uh, it was like Ninja 3. The Awakening. I don't even remember. Um, which we one... also adored and yes. which was also abominable. Yes. Um, that one was just on and we were at a convention. And uh, But yeah, like what does this mean? When Whenever we're talking about art, I do think though what the artist's intention is in some way has to play into it. And this is why I don't 100% subscribe to the death of the author philosophy, um, mm -hmm. because I don't think, like I do think you can separate artist from art in some cases, but if you're going to critique a piece of art, I don't think you can, right? Yeah. I think you have to look at what the author was trying to do, the artist was trying to do, and say, all right, what is this, what is, is this a good example of what the artist wants to do? And this is, this gets back to my kind of, dislike of a lot of criticism on the internet as opposed to how i view a lot of professional reviewers right mm -hmm. um, a good professional reviewer and a good writing group member and a good any sort of critiquer can take a piece and say all right what type of story is this trying to be and how can i either critique its ability to do that or help it become a better version of what it wants to be yeah well and, and tied up in that same question is uh, who is this for? Mm -hmm. And this goes back to when we were talking about food and food snobbery. Uh, there are foods that I think are terrible, but they're not for me. Yeah, you just ordered ceviche for our, our dinner, <laughs> which is about as far as you can get from a food that I want. Um, but just a bunch of raw fish and yeah. lemon juice and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but yeah, 
it's, I was actually, I'll, I'll not mention the person's name, even though you can probably figure out who it is. I was watching a video essay from a video, video essay. So it just kind of popped up in my, my thing. Cause I, I do like YouTube video essays. It helps me understand my own ways of critiquing things mm -hmm. by um, analyzing how other people are offering criticism. And there was one that I just, I just turned off um, because it, um, it was, Starting out, it was talking about plot holes. And plot holes are already this kind of fraught thing, right? Um, is a movie having a plot hole a valid... Well, you can critique anything you want. I don't want to say it's not valid, but is, yeah, it, yeah. is it the sort of criticism that I think is useful? And m a lot of the times it's not because every piece of fiction is going to have plot holes um, mm -hmm. because it's not made in the real world. If you push hard enough against any piece of fiction you will find the holes um even you know nonfiction. we can't contain the entirety of talking about somebody's life um in a in a narrative a biography like you push against yeah. that and you're gonna find holes in what the biography I mean, put that's, in that's that's the reason phrases like truth is stranger than fiction exist yeah because real life can get away with ridiculous coincidences and pointless motivations in a way that fiction can't right yeah well in this uh this person one of the things they pointed out is a big plot hole that was a problem was that terminator 2 um violated the first movie's um a principle that you couldn't send something non-organic back in time because of the t-1000 mm. and this was like a central premise that the argument was making and i'm I thought this is this is just this is just a pointless um nitpick because yeah. the way that that I view this Terminator 2 establishes that you can do this now. Mm -hmm. No one watching that movie um in you know who is enjoy like you know no one who's not looking to nitpick that's a double negative it doesn't make any sense. Uh <laughs> people who are sitting and and accepting the movie for what it is um, do not sit there and think, ah, this movie's ruined. The first movie, what they say is, oh, I guess they can do that now, right? Yeah. Or I guess this thing does that. I it's guess they were wrong the first yeah. time. Yeah. They hadn't developed the tech yet, or they uh, just hadn't perfected it. My favorite one of these I saw on Twitter today actually repeated yet again, uh, the, the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Right. My favorite explanation for that is, well, Han Solo was just trying to con somebody, yes. trying to look cool in front of this idiot farm boy. He didn't know what he was talking about. And the the thing about that, like this one is, it's different, like plot holes can be something that really make a movie fall apart. When they mm -hmm. pile on top of each other is one way for me, or when they are a, cent a plot hole that the majority of the audience will get confused by is happens um involving the resolution of a major conflict right if a majority or even a significant portion of your audience there is sitting it, audience is sitting there saying wait wait what then you have a problem with mm -hmm. your story uh so plot holes are never not a problem but in your establishment when it's like all right this thing's been sent back in time that is a central premise of our movie yeah you're already going to accept that <laughs> they have robots in the future that want to kill people in the past you just got to accept the premise of the movie. That's not a plot hole at all. That mm -hmm. is the setup for this story. And um, every story has that. And so those sorts of things kind of get on my nerves. The Cinema Sins sort of things. Like, I oh, cannot I watch those. an episode of Cinema Sins. Or, you know, Cinema Sins or uh, Everything Wrong with X Movie in 10 Minutes. Yes. Uh, even Honest Trailers drive me crazy yep. because all they're doing is looking for flaws. Yep. And I hate it. Uh, do you know what the one I do like? I don't know why, but I really like the pitch meeting. Um, I haven't once. watched oh, any of those. You haven't seen pitch meetings? I, I uh, you know, there, there's a, a guy, uh, there's a movie reviewer mm -hmm. that I read who used to do an article series about pitch meetings. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of irks me. The, it, the, the, probably this YouTube series did mm -hmm. not steal his idea. It might have. But he there's said an element of it where it just bothers me. When when he when he like he's gone talked about how he came up with this. I think he just said I was watching a comic and they did a pitch meeting for a show. Okay. I was like, oh, that'd be a good YouTube series, and then he just ran with it. Um, there is there is something about it 
that um, that works for me. You should watch one, and we'll okay. talk about them later. Uh, but they those things really irk me. But I love deep dive um, video essays, which mm-hmm. often can be very critical of a piece. Um, and I really enjoy watching those. And I like reading criticism. I like understanding stories getting broken down. I've mentioned before that the Red Letter Media breakdowns of the prequels is one of my favorite pieces of uh, media criticism. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what makes a thing perfect? It's a hard thing for me to say, but more and more I'm moving away from using that phrase. It's not a perfect movie, but. And just saying, you know what? A piece of art, to me, can be perfect. It is a piece of art that has been released and become beloved to the point that the flaws are part of the art mm-hmm. to this at this point. Well, and I'm I I'm gonna agree and go so far as to say even critiquable and flawed art can yes. still be perfect. Yes. Which maybe makes the word perfect meaningless in this context, mm. but I think we know I know what you mean by it, and yeah. at, at the very yeah. least, which is this could not have been better at least is 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 maybe how i think of that right um that this movie is exactly the movie it needs to be in order to do what it's doing and a lot of the critique i think comes down to um this isn't all of them but a lot of them comes down to you can't do everything with every film and every story that you tell will have problems for instance um i think one of my better works is the way of kings um and there is a major sort of thing you can critique about Way. There's a lot you can critique, but one of the main mm-hmm. things you can critique about Way of Kings is it has an enormous learning curve, very steep, very difficult to get into. A lot of characters thrown at you very quickly, and a um, very difficult magic system in a very odd setting for an epic fantasy world. The strange is very strange in the first. 11 12 chapters of uh, of way of kings yeah. until we can settle into a plot that gives you a bit of familiar um with the the bridge crews and kaladin and that's a very valid criticism but it's not a flaw mm-hmm. right because yeah. i intentionally chose to write this book that way because the piece of art i was creating involved a steep learning curve and the payoffs i wanted to do at the end meant that i had to front load a lot of um of things and I stand by that and say, this is what I wanted to do. This is the piece of art I wanted to make. And that's the way you wanted to make it. Still a valid criticism, right? If you're talking to someone saying, you're recommending Way of Kings, I do suggest that you tell them, it's got a steep learning curve, if they understand that terminology. It's hard to get into. Mm -hmm. Totally like valid and a good thing to critique about the series. Yeah. Well, you know, and this, this, I I remember reading a, a big old thing you wrote on Reddit at one point where some guy was trying to convince his girlfriend to read Way of Kings mm. and she couldn't get into it. And he was like, how can I convince her that this is as brilliant as it is? And you got on and could have gone in a number of snarky different directions. And what you basically said was, you know what? It's not for everybody and that's okay. And it doesn't have to be. Uh, she's a wonderful person, even if she doesn't like the same art that you like. Uh, which I think is a really good thing to keep in mind when we're talking about perfect art. Something was perfect for him and not for her, and that doesn't mean either of them were wrong. Right. Yeah. And this doesn't, again, mean that we can't be wrong or pieces can't be wrong. I mean, if I look at... um, Here's another example from my own work. Um, I took over The Wheel of Time for Robert Jordan. And um, there are multiple different characters in there um, that I interpreted slightly different than perhaps him or the audience. Um, if we take two of these, Matt and Lan, um, I interpret Lan a certain way. He's a, he's a character that uh, Robert Jordan only wrote from his viewpoint very infrequently, and I got from those um, writings a certain picture of who he was in my head. And when I wrote from his viewpoint, I wrote through that picture. Mm-hmm. Um, people have critiqued that. Totally valid to critique it. I stand by my depiction. It is how I view the character and how I think the, who the character is. Yeah. The other character, Matt, I tried and I missed a little bit. Um, it was a swing. It was like a it was like a foul ball. I didn't like completely miss, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but um, but it was off enough that it distracts readers. And when people pointed out some of these things, I said, you know what? I got it wrong. Um, I think you're right. And using that criticism, I think I got better 
each book. Mm -hmm. And even at the end, I don't think my Matt, I, I would have liked to have done him better, even in the, the places where I was get, doing a better job. Um, and these are two characters that you might read and to you might view the same way, right? Um, mm -hmm. This is the characters off, Brandon, to get them right. Where one I'll defend and one I won't. Um, and it kind of this author intent, I think, in that case is really important to the criticism. Definitely. All right. So let me talk about one of the ones on my list. Okay. One of my five perfect movies. Go for it. Okay. And I actually have more than five perfect yes. movies. And so the fact that they're perfect means that they are all essentially equal in my eyes, except, of course, for Jaws, which is the greatest movie of all time. But okay. the first one I want to talk about is, is the one I hinted at in the very beginning, Mary mm -hmm. Poppins. Now, Mary Poppins is one of my favorite movies of all time. I think it's mm -hmm. one of the greatest movies. It has a number of big flaws. For example, P.L. Travers, who wrote the Mary Poppins books, hated it. Yes. I think she's wrong to hate it, but, it's you know. It's something worth talking about yeah. in criticism. Um, um, Dick Van Dyke's accent. Dick Van Dyke, often. that yeah. was the other one I was going to mention. Mm -hmm. That's arguably the worst British accent, like, in movie history. Oh, there's some YouTube videos where we get some, um, we get an accent coach critiquing various accents, and he does like to occasionally pick out some uh, some very interesting ones, but it is among the worst. Yeah. Yes. Um, I remember watching uh, just a YouTube video of British actors talking about American accents, mm -hmm. and it was really interesting and kind of funny, and they were all going through and saying, well, you know, this is this one, or this one's very hard for me, or this is what I learned from doing this one. And the final question for all of them, and there were probably 30 people on this list, uh, was, what's the worst British accent you've ever heard? And across the board, it was Dick Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke, okay. Well, and that's a... in spite yeah. of that, mm -hmm. and arguably, like we were talking about earlier, maybe even because of that, it's, it works perfectly in the movie for me. I love it. Uh, well, here's, here's some reasons why I could argue that it remains a perfect movie. Despite that, number one, would the movie have been better without Dick Van Dyke and someone else in that role? Dick Van Dyke is really good in that role. He really is. He has amazing chemistry um, with Mary Poppins. He adds a lot of energy. He is an, a little bit of a living cartoon, kind mm -hmm. of like Jim Carrey. And so he, when they transition into the animated sequences, Dick Van Dyke being there with that big one animated yeah. sequence, really helps me with that transition, um, that it's not just Mary Poppins, that he is there. He bridges the the real world and mm -hmm. the cartoon world better than almost any other actor they could have gotten because of how goofy and cartoony and rubbery he is. So you can make, one argument you make that I would make is that to get Dan Van, Dick Van Dyke, you just have to deal with the accent. And it's still mm -hmm. the best movie that could have been made. And in those terms, it becomes a perfect movie because it could not have been improved in any conceivable or any, um, yeah, in yeah, any relevant way to our conversation. The, the Step in Time dance number, one of the greatest dance numbers in movie musical history. And it works in part because of how long limbed and lanky he is. Mm -hmm. uh, the scene that comes after that where he and Mr. Banks are talking about fatherhood is so good. Almost every wonderful part of that movie has Dick Van Dyke in it. Well, I'm not going to say that it's perfect because of him. No. But it's not imperfect because of him. Right. <laughs> no, there's a, that's, a, that's an excellent example for talking about why we think that movie can be perfect, despite saying, yeah, well, you know, but the, the counter-argument would be, well, if Dick Van Dyke had had extra language coaches and had done a better job with the accent, would then the movie have been better? And in such case, it could not be perfect. I mean, you can totally argue that. I can counter-argue by saying what you said before. Part of the charm of that piece of art is what happened with Dick Van Dyke's accent, right? Like, that's yeah. part of the story. It's part of what makes it charming. Um, you get this sense that even you can even argue you get the sense that Dick Van Dyke is not British in context of the world yeah. and is doing an accent because he's not even human, right? There's this argument yeah, he, that Mary he's Poppins another one of these eldritch beings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, 
the the long and short of it is it's a piece of art and calling yeah calling out pieces of art on things is totally legit but i still think they can be perfect i'm yeah. there with you and and i know that there are people out there i know there are people listening to this mm-hmm. who hate the movie because of that accent or because of some loyalty they have to pl travers or for whatever reason yep. None of you are wrong. You're all right. I'm also right. Art is confusing that way. <laughs> Let's bring up mine then, Lord of the Rings. I'm just going to count them as one film. Okay. Um, though if I pick one, I do like the second one the best. Agreed. And so if I'm going to pick a a most perfect uh, section of the film, it's that one. Uh, I really like Helm Steep. I love the stuff with Theoden. Um, I just... So much of that movie works really well for me. All the stuff with um, with second movie is where you really get into Gollum. Yep, um, and the fantastic scenes. I mean, even Peter Jackson has said the best scene of the entire trilogy is Gollum talking to himself. Okay, um, what is the best scene for me? It, that is one of the best. It would mm-hmm. definitely rank. But I, my favorite scene is when Gandalf appears over the rise um, at the Battle of Helm's Deep. Um, and you know, he's got the writers there and the sunlight comes and all of that. That's just pure Brandon, yeah. you know, beauty. I love scenes like that in films. If I had to pick mm-hmm. a best scene from the trilogy overall, yeah. it would be, uh, the charge of the Rohirrim in Pelennor Field. Okay. Although a very close second is also from Return of the King, which is, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. That's definitely a top five like moment my, for me. My also. wife yeah. has seen me cry a tiny handful of times. Yes. Those two are two of them. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, you pick, you, you, you've you got some good Lord of the Rings taste there. But there are a lot of people who would say, is this a perfect movie? Could you not imagine a better adaptation of Lord of the Rings involving Tom Bombadil and the Scouring the Shire and the things that were cut from the film in order to make it um, fit to like the Hollywood extra standards. Hobbit who didn't even get in? Yes, whatever his name was. Um, and there's you know there's the other like kind of deeper character critiques where I could be reading this wrong. Like I see the book Aragorn as not nearly as reluctant to be king as mm-hmm. the movie aragorn i see the book aragorn as biding his time until it is time to be king um rather than being a reluctant hero and i see peter jackson saying eh, let's add, inject a little more tension and a little bit more conflict yeah. into him mm-hmm. uh and you know there's stuff like that um there is and there's uh like the uh the army of the dead yeah which i think is incredibly wonderful until it becomes just a green smear uh, cleaning up the battlefield right. at which point even on the first viewing i laughed at it yeah it is it is the weakest part of them so maybe maybe that's enough of a flaw that i would call return of the king not perfect maybe it does bug me uh, i uh, in my lectures you can hear me kind of rant about that one um during the plotting and mm-hmm. how much better the film treatment of helm's deep is than the arrival of the the ghosts yeah um, because the the kind of deus ex machina you get with your favorite scene, Gandalf mm-hmm. coming over the rise and charging down the hill, that works in a way the Army of the Dead doesn't. Right. And the books, it's been a while, but I remember the books handling them slightly differently. Um, the reason that it works for, if you haven't seen my lectures, sorry for those who have, you might be getting, yeah. <laughs> but the reason it works for me is, is set up and pay off, right? With Gandalf, he says, give me five days. Look for mm-hmm. me on the morning of the fifth day. Um, and, uh, I will return and you just got to survive five days again, uh, Aragorn. Yeah. And, and so the, the whole battle sequence yeah. is not, how are we going to win? It's, can we hang on for five days? Right. And the brilliance of how he films it is you forget because it gets so dark and so grim that you don't know, you forget that it's about Gandalf coming back and mm-hmm. you are there in the, um, you know, the saddle with them when they do that last charge and you're like, this is it. I understand like the siege has failed. Uh, the, the siege has succeeded. But yeah. The defense has failed. And then when Gandalf comes up and you remember, it's just one of those beautiful mil- moments in storytelling. And I can every time get myself to forget like not really, but you know, I can suspend mm-hmm. my disbelief and I can be there. It is presented so powerfully with the uh, the characters. 
um, that I'm just I'm just on board every single time. And yeah. with the ghosts, I am on board all the way up until they become the green smear. Right? I really like Aragorn yeah. uh, convincing the them. The whole thing and, in Dunharrow yeah. mm-hmm. works, and them you know coming off of the pirate ship yep. works. Yep. Um, it's just something about the framing and filming and put to, putting together means that the rest of them didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And only it's like one party member mattered in the team and everybody else could it was doing a filler episode. And yeah, I, and maybe that's what it is. I mm-hmm. don't know. But, uh, you know, yep. I'm, I'm, now I'm trying to think of my favorite scenes in uh, Two Towers. Yeah. And uh, the arrival at uh, Edoras. OK. And oh, it's beautiful. Drawing mm-hmm. Saruman like poison from oh, a wound. Man. That, that moment is so good. And the way it's filmed is incredible, the the camera tricks that they do. But even just Gandalf walking forward while the yeah. three hunters are taking out thugs all around yeah. him. Well, he, he's shrugging off his cloak and becoming yeah. Gandalf the White. Um, yeah. Everything about it. It um, is a wonderful, I love that scene. scene. I love all the tree beard stuff. Mm-hmm. I love uh, the Ents demolishing Isengard. Mm-hmm. And that was basically the B team. Yeah, that was like the second or third unit director just saying, oh, "Okay, yeah? uh, what a w- workshop! Give me some cool like ent stuff. Let's watch some trees break some things. Come up with whatever you want." Uh, and that's all it is, and yet it's so wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, perfect film. Two Towers, mm-hmm. perfect film. Uh, the first one is perfect, also. The third one has one major flaw that bugs me every time I watch it. And since it does kick me out of the film, rather than me just admiring it for what it is, then I would probably have to give it yeah. a, a, a a little red mark. And, and it's so interesting because, like, so many of my very favorite things um, are all in the third movie. Mm-hmm. Like... Um, you bow to you know, no Eowyn one. Yeah. pulling her helmet off. Oh, I am yeah. no man. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how I saw it in my head since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gan- uh, Gollum's smile as he falls into the lava with the ring on his hand. Just the look on his face of yep. even though he's dying, this is the happiest he's ever been. Those are all perfect moments. And yet, maybe it is just the army of the dead that, that, uh, that loses it a point. So let me ask you this. Would the Lord of the Rings films be better? We're going to go to a classic argument here just to kind of frame our conversation. Mm -hmm. Would they be better if there was a line where Gandalf said, we can't take the eagles because they will be spotted by the Nazgul, and the whole point is to be soft and quiet with the approach of the ring? Would the films be better because so many people get distracted by that? Mm -hmm. Even though in the lore and context and even in the narrative, uh, just thinking about it for a few minutes, says... Oh yeah, we can't take the eagles for the same reason we aren't having our army march up and yeah. carry the ring. Um, not a flaw of the story, but so many people get distracted by it. Is yeah. there an argument that you should take into account? Like if I were writing, how about that? If I were writing this book and I got that feedback from beta readers, I would put that line in somewhere mm-hmm. just to keep viewers from being distracted. And that line, it would be one line. Mm-hmm. It would be almost unnoticeable. Yep. Um. I don't know if it would make it better. Mm. I don't know. The fact that you can explain why in one sentence also, why, you know. Yeah. Does, uh, so, that's an interesting kind of critique of our critique. Because it is. It's a, it's a good example of something that, um, that maybe we had, you had that a lot of space in those movies and those extended editions. Unilaterally improve it. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I admit I like the fact that it is never really explained. And and that is in part because I love Tolkien's penchant for Deus Ex Machina. And that is because he was an infantryman in World War I. And so he does have very clear emotional response to the arrival of aircraft, right? Like, and every major battle, almost, you know, even in The Hobbit, is solved by... We've hung on as long as we can, and then someone else came and solved this for us. And it happens every single time, and I kind of love that about it. You know, he's going to... he Somewhere 
you know, he's probably not listening to our podcast wherever he is. He <laughs> he's is got probably interviewing the Beowulf um, poet, right? I mean, probably, but or just getting drunk with him somewhere. Yeah, if uh, if if it were he were here, he would maybe quote at you that line of his that he abs- uh, abhors metaphor or abhors. It's not metaphor isn't the word he uses, but it's what he means. Yeah, um, yeah. That he does not uh, allegory. He abhors mm-hmm. allegory and does not want you. But and so did Mark Twain. Yeah, and yet it's mm-hmm. there in all of their stuff, whether they like it or not. Well, and I do think we. I, I like to bring this one up because it's fun. It's an English major thing. I do think we misinterpret Grandpa Tolkien a little bit. He does not want his story to be a one-to-one allegory. Does not mean mm-hmm. that he wants people to ignore the subtext. basic subtext and criticism. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, all right. What's your What's your next movie? Uh, well, let's just talk about Jaws since I already okay. said Jaws. Jaws is my very favorite movie of all time. I think it is a flawlessly constructed movie. Uh, ironically for this discussion, I think that all of the problems they had while filming it made it inarguably better oh, yeah. than Everybody their original agrees. plan. Um, like, I have taught classes on Jaws. I have broken down the structure of Jaws. Um, the dialogue, the acting, the everything in it. I just love it with every... I love every drop of that movie. I cannot disagree. I would um, also accept Jaws as a perfect movie. Um, It is one of those movies that I didn't see for many years because in the back of my head, I was like, this is going to be... Like, I had lumped it with Apocalypse Now and the, this is going to be too violent and disturbing for me movie, if that makes any sense. Well, that's how it was originally sold, was this is a summer monster movie. Yeah. And you get to watch a bunch of people get eaten by a shark. But more than that, I knew it was a classic of cinematic masterpiece. And so I knew, so a summer monster movie wouldn't really appeal to me that much, but it's fine. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I I enjoy Jurassic Park. I guess it's another Spielberg. But, you could, but the knowledge that it was regarded as a cinematic masterpiece made my brain think it, it was going to be about the gore in part, right? Mm-hmm. That it was going to be, Artistic use of blood and yes. prosthetics. And that sort of thing, um, which, you know, as I grew older, I came to appreciate things like The Thing, right? Mm-hmm. Which is kind of about that. Yeah. Um, and whatnot. But when I was younger, I'm like, I don't know. And then I'm like, I should just watch it. And it is very different from what I anticipated. Uh, and it is, uh, it's much like different film, but Rocky which I never watched. I'm like, eh, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I know everyone loves, it's probably one of the greatest sports movies ever or whatever. And then I watched it. I'm like, wow, this is so good. And it is so good for reasons I didn't understand by not watching this film for years. I didn't see Rocky till I was like in my late twenties. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think I was, I was in my thirties mm-hmm. when I finally saw Rocky. But yes. Um, I mean, the best scene in Jaws I don't think my take will be controversial. Um, it is the um, the monologue about the sinking of the yeah. um, the Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Uh, well, and not just... just the monologue, but the scene as a whole mm-hmm. is first of all one of the greatest male bonding scenes ever put on film, where you watch these three people from all vastly different backgrounds and mindsets come together over a couple of shared experiences, and then it turns into that Indianapolis monologue. Well, and then that also is just, that's the most terrified I was in that movie, or I ever am, is him He's listening to Robert Shaw describe that. Yeah. Um, And it sets the scene for them being alone out on the ocean, fighting this thing with their ship sinking, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Like, it is such a perfect setup, but at the same time, it's the most frightening scene in the movie for me. Yeah. Uh, thinking about that and the real world horror of those people is, you know, and and with- most of that monologue Robert Shaw wrote, did he himself? It was not in the script. Oh, uh, there was a an Indianapolis thing, and then Robert Shaw was like, "No, I'm going to change this." And the the morning of, he handed the director some extra pages and said, "This is what I'm doing." 
Well, uh, <laughs> give him a raise. Um, you know, that was yeah. so good. One of my greatest regrets as a writer is that I was born too late to have a Robert Shaw in any movie made out of my work. <laughs> um, reminds me of the Christopher Lee scene uh, from the behind the scenes on Lord of the Rings where uh, Peter Jackson is telling him how to, you've all heard this, I'm how sure. How to stab someone um, in the how back. How to sound like he got stabbed in the back. And he's like, <laughs> Peter, do you know what someone sounds like when they get stabbed with a knife in the back? And he said, well, no. He's like, well, I do. Um, and let me just describe it to you. Uh, I, that that story is so pervasive yeah. that we probably shouldn't spend time on it. But if you haven't, then you are one of the lucky people that gets to go yeah. look up Christopher Lee telling that look story up Christopher on YouTube. Christopher Lee and look up, uh, he was involved in, and this is not something I'm making up, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare is yes. what his unit was called, which is one of the most amazing things. Anyway... Christopher Lee talking on the um, the the actor's commentary of those DVDs is just a delight every time. Yeah. Uh, particularly because he will get a, get there and say, well, when I was speaking with Professor Tolkien about this role, um, uh, you know, back yeah. when I was going to play Gandalf, he explained that yada, 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 yada. It, so. And what, what makes it so great is that the stuff he says... Mm -hmm sounds insane yes. until you realize how true it is mm -hmm. like there's one point in the special features where he talks about how next to basil rathbone i think that i have done more on-screen sword fights than any other living actor and you're like you ridiculous oh wait a minute no you probably have haven't you <laughs> all right um let's do another of mine um and um then do we have to break we, we probably ought to break and do a lot the rest of these <laughs> on another episode so what can we talk about for 10 minutes on my list all right i want to pick one that's different i've got a few that are similar to ones we've done before and we'll get to those some other time okay. but i want to talk about princess mononoke hey i've got a, a miyazaki on my list as do well, you but it's not that one mm. Uh, so Princess Mononoke, why is it a perfect film to me? Well, I would think it's self-evident if you've ever seen Princess Mononoke. <laughs> um, but, uh, if you haven't, like, it is one of the best, like, um, epic fantasies ever put to film. Mm -hmm. It is using its medium really brilliantly to do things that couldn't be done with other effects and whatnot, like where the forest spirit walks and the flowers bloom is yeah. an effect that works in animation in a way that I don't think could work even in CG mm -hmm. because of just how beautiful yet... Um, it could be yeah. done in CG. It could be. But it wouldn't have the same impact. It would not have the same impact. Um, I love the narrative of it. I, I really love that it is a different... Um, storytelling traditions look at epic fantasy told through a different lens with a different style of like, you know, it does not adhere to Western beats of storytelling mm -hmm. in ways that are fascinating and improve my ability to understand storytelling by watching it. Yeah. Um, and I got to see it in the theaters when it was first released. I was one of like three people in the theater and i am not an anime aficionado now my brother just said you should go see this film i remember seeing this mm -hmm. in its initial theatrical run with my wife and i want to say it was you and ben was it the four of us that went to see so it? i took you guys to it after after I, you'd already seen I'd it i'd seen it okay it was um it's one of i've only gone to a handful of movies twice in the theater Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a go rewatch person, but I watched this movie and I went to you guys and said, you need to come see this before it leaves the theater. Yeah. Um, because it is, I had, ne I wasn't experienced with Miyazaki at that point. Um, I had never seen any of his films. Um, it was the first one I saw. Yeah. And I was blown away. It, like when I saw Lord of the Rings, I expected it to be good, and it was, and I yeah. hoped it was good. When I went to Princess Mononoke, I had no idea what to, what I was getting, mm -hmm. and it became one of the most um, amazing experiences of my life. So. Yeah, no, and and you know, in in line with the rest of the movies we've been talking about, it does have things that are weird about it. Yes. Like, I remember even after we watched it and we loved it and we gushed about it for weeks, 
we would still jokingly for months thereafter say, oh, great spirit of the forest, I give you your head. Yes, that Which was the isn't line. isn't even necessarily a bad line of mm-hmm. dialogue. And like you said, it comes from a very different cultural right. storytelling tradition. But it made us all laugh at kind of how goofy and unexpected it was, mm-hmm. which isn't a problem with the movie. Just we, we it, it was different than what we were used to. Yeah. What's your let's we'll go ahead and do your Miyazaki. My film. Miyazaki yeah, is my neighbor Totoro. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Love this one. I am surprised it's not Spirited Away, which is the obvious answer. Spirited Away is the obvious answer. Mm hmm. Um, Spirited Away is maybe his best movie. Yeah. But it's not the one either of us picked as a perfect movie. Yeah. I would count it as perfect. Um, but it could, because if I were going to put on Monokie or Spirited Away, I wouldn't be able to decide which one to put on. Mm -hmm. Um, I would just, I love them both so much. Uh, but I, my, in my inclinations are more toward epic fantasy than portal fantasy. And so an epic fantasy is just, yeah. My the, jam. There, the, the thing for me, as much as I love both of those, there mm-hmm. are bits in the middle of them, kind of late second act, uh-huh. where I do get, uh, I do think it, that they get slow. Okay. So and that's interesting because Totoro doesn't do that for me. Totoro bores me. It really <laughs> does. The whole film, I'm just like, okay. All right. They're bouncing on the stomach. Okay. Uh, See the maybe it's because I watch it with my kids so much, mm-hmm. uh, but Totoro has no villain. Mm-hmm. It has, for the most part, no conflict. Yeah. Um, and yet, I mean, it doesn't follow any of the rules of what we think a good story has to have, and yet it works flawlessly for me. It is a great movie. It's not perfect for me because I just get bored. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like. I watched Totoro, and I'm like, can I watch almost any other Miyazaki film instead? Um, and so it's it doesn't work on that level for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the visuals are amazing. The storytelling is really interesting and innovative. I just yeah, no, no, and that makes sense. What uh, what really sells it for me is, I mean, so much of fantasy is really hinged on sense of wonder, and Totoro is all about sense of wonder. Mm-hmm. And their, you know, their mom is in the hospital, so there is drama. Yes, but there's not no traditional conflict in like we need to cure her or we need to save her or even we need to pull together as a family because they already are. Yeah, they they yeah. already are, and things are going well. Um, there's a little sequence, kind of third act, where the the younger sister freaks out and she thinks the mom is going to die and she runs away to try to find her. Um, but that's resolved really quickly. And really what you're just doing is you're looking at the world through the eyes of these two little girls. One of my favorite parts of the whole movie is when that one little sister, uh, right off at the beginning, uh, the first time she sees the Totoros, she sees the two little ones. And they run underneath the house and she can't fit. So she goes around to the other door where she thinks they're going to come out. She just sits there watching. And a little butterfly flies by and it's the only thing that even moves on the screen and just how much that says about you know Miyazaki's artistic sensibilities and what he was trying to show you and finding you know taking the time to show the little pretty butterfly float past her head as she waits for these Totoros to come out um I just love it and you're probably watching that scene thinking, why isn't anyone moving? There's nothing coming out of the door. This is so boring. No, no here's the thing. <laughs> I, like any given scene, like that one's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I will, I enjoy watching that scene. But I have the same problem with Miyazaki as I do actually with um, a book like 100 Years of Solitude, mm-hmm. uh, which is a masterpiece, right? Uh, and you give me any five pages from that, and I'm going to read those five pages, and I'm going to be like, wow, those were some good five pages. I'm done, right? (laughs) No character to latch onto, no real archetypes going on, no Mm -hmm. no narrative to really, and so yeah, no compelling through line. I'm just other than just watching this family grow up. I'm going to appreciate it and then be bored and probably be writing a book in my head, Um, right? And Mm -hmm. if 
if I start writing a book in my head instead of appreciating your piece of art, then uh, then there's a problem because, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. This well. has been tangents upon tangents upon tangents. Join us <laughs> next time when we do not continue our top five uh, perfect movies. We'll do that another time. We'll, we'll do something next next time to take a, a break. This is why we don't title our episodes because then we would be lying to you. <laughs> Thank <music> you.